thank you. In this particular part of this exposition, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a hypothetical patient and take him through a lifespan of diabetes. And so the objectives here are to review the two major guidelines that, that sort of rule our lives when we talk about type 2 diabetes uh, in the US. Also, a possible sequence, and I, I want you to stress, it's a possible sequence of medication utilization to the dynamic progression of type 2 diabetes, and then we'll sort of touch on the mode of action of these agents. So, the case for discussion is a 53-year-old lady who presents with fatigue. I'm sure you've never seen this lady ever before. She has a recent weight gain of about 10 pounds. She has a history of irregular periods, had gestational diabetes, and did, develop, did develop, deliver a Mack truck, which is a baby over a nine pounds. She has my problem. She never achieved her ideal height for her weight, in that she's 194 pounds at a height of 64.5 inches. Her waist is 38 inches. Her blood pressure is 154 over 92, pulse of 88. She has mild acanthosis, nigricans. Her fasting sugar is 147, hemoglobin A1C of 6.8, and her cholesterol is uh, marginal uh, with a high triglycerides and a low HDL. So, what is this lady telling me? She presents with fatigue. Fatigue is a very nonspecific uh, complaint. But in the context of someone who's in the process of developing diabetes, one must remember that insulin is the most tiring hormone known to man. If you know someone who's really fat, who talks too much, feed them. They'll fall asleep. And so I think it's important to understand that insulin does that. If you know she's hyperinsulinemic because she's got hyperpigmentation of her creases, the neck. She has a history of irregular periods, PCOS, polycystic ovary disease the difficulty with becoming pregnant, gestational diabetes, all says she had insulin resistance way before this period of time. And obviously the weight gain tells you, and the sudden weight gain tells you that she's changed and that she's becoming markedly hyperinsulinemic. Now, the ADA and the ASD have this uh, guidelines for managing hyperglycemia in type 2 diabetes. Wonderful guidelines, very well done, about a million times better than the last one. What they tell you is you make a diagnosis of diabetes, you should start them on lifestyle changes, probably with the immediate addition of metformin. If you do not get significant control, meaning a hemoglobin A1C less than 7% within three to four months, you have to consider a two drug combination. And since we have so many drugs that are available, you can answer a few questions to decide which drug is best. And the questions are, how much efficacy do you want? Is the hemoglobin A1C 10 or about 7.5? How much are you willing to take in terms of the risk of hypoglycemia? Some of these drugs cause significant hypoglycemia. Maybe the patient is not a good candidate for hypoglycemia, not to say anyone ever is. How much weight can you afford to gain? No one can afford to gain weight in type 2 diabetes, but sometimes you're willing to make the choice that you will get better control for weight gain. Side effects. Absolutely something that you want to keep in mind. Can they tolerate edema? Would they go into congestive heart failure? And obviously, in our world, costs. Costs play a rich role. So you answer those questions to come up with the second to, uh, a drug to add to metformin. And then they say, well, you're still not controlled after three or four months. What is the next step? And again, you go through the three drug combinations, and you come up with the best. And at that time, if you still haven't got control, you have to consider insulin. And that's what basically the ADA's position is. Very appropriate, very patient-centered, very individualized. I personally like the uh, approach of the American Association of Clinical Endocrinology. They've made their guidelines much more practical to the practicing physician. Basically, they divide the patient who presents for the first time with diabetes into three groups. If the hemoglobin A1C at presentation is less than 7.5%, Yes, metformin is certainly the best platform to start, but any of the drugs would work very well. If on the other hand, they start, come in with hemoglobin A1C greater than 7.5%, they're already exhibiting that the disease has progressed further. Under those circumstances, the chances that one drug will, cause, will allow you to treat this patient are small. You want to treat both. And the problem with treating with one is it's a failure-driven psychology. You know, I start a drug, 
I fail, then I go to the next one. On the other hand, by doing it this way, I'm looking at the pathophysiology. This person is further down on the road of diabetes. I need to combine early. You can consider triple therapy if you haven't got benefit with early combination therapy. If the hemoglobin A1C is greater than 9%, then they ask you to differentiate the patient. If the patient has symptoms, they're waking up at night, they're losing weight very rapidly, maybe they're becoming slightly foggy in their thinking. This person is clearly insulin deficient, at least at the time. They need insulin. On the other hand, they have no symptoms. Yes, their sugars are really high. Yes, they're peeing a little bit, but they're not uncomfortable. You might want to try a combination agent first to see if you can get control and then go on to insulin. I think it's sort of important to sort of think. I think this is a very practical way to think about how you treat uh, patients with diabetes. So, case that we talked about, the first line treatment, we did the diet, the exercise, put it on metformin. Lots of benefits to metformin. Glucose control, absolutely. Lipid effects, yes, it does have effects on free fatty acids. It improves the lipid profile to a certain extent. Vascular effects, it has certainly got significant uh, uh, changes in inflammatory markers. It cuts down the inflammatory markers. It has structural benefits, and it has antimitotic effects. Not proven except in epidemiology and phenomenology. As we look back on large databases, there seems to be a decreased incidence of colon cancer, and seems to be a decreased incidence of, of breast cancer. When used in patients with uh, pancreatic cancer, metformin seems to have a ameliorating effect. So clearly, it has other effects that are beneficial. How does metformin work? Basically, metformin is a mitochondrial poison. What it does is it goes to the uh, complex one of the mitochondrial chain and it blocks it. Because it blocks it, it changes the whole function of the chain and by doing that, it allows for a decrease in hepatic glucose output. And when you look at all the effects it has on, the hepatic, on hepatic nucleogenesis, and if you think I'm going to go through this slide in any detail, you got another thing coming. The point I'm trying to make here is the effect of metformin and its effect on changing the ATP AMP complex affects a whole series of intercellular mechanisms that, number one, allow you to stop gluconeogenesis. Number two, stop lipogenesis and therefore stop steatosis. And I think those are the two major ones that I want to concentrate on for the time being. And so when you look at what metformin does, it acts along all, this, all the effects of the cells and affects all the effects of the cells because it changes the AMP-ATP ratio. Uh, I, don't want, I don't need to uh, belabor this point much further. It has effects of the liver, skeletal muscle, gut, pancreas, and fat, and clearly ameliorates all of those major tissues. So I start this lady on metformin. Six months later, she's lost a little bit of weight. Her fasting sugar is great. Hemoglobin A1C is acceptable. Hey, I did a great job. 15 months later, life happens, or the brown stuff falls in all our lives. So the weight goes up to 199 pounds. Her fasting sugar is now backed up to 148. Her hemoglobin A1C is 7.5. So now she's clearly not responding to metformin. What do you do now? Classically, we would have said, this is the place where we start sulfonylureas. Cheap, long history, great stuff, but high incidence of hypoglycemia, high incidence of weight gain. We might have a better uh, option. And nowadays with the incretins, that's a better option. I've told you that beta cell loss is what causes the progression of diabetes. And when you look at the, uh, at this, uh, U, at the UKPDS, what you see here is that in fact, sulfonylureas in the green improved insulin production but you still continue deteriorating as you see in the graph on the right side. So sulfonylureas controlled the glucose, didn't stop the progression of the disease. If you look at beta cell mass, you see here that beta cell mass is clearly less in people with diabetes. So you're flogging a dead horse. The second thing that happens is the f beta cell functionality is lost. As the beta cell starts to overwork, it loses its first phase of insulin secretion. Think about this. What is the importance of the first phase of insulin secretion? If you eat, you produce insulin right away, you stop glucagon right away, you stop the liver from producing glucose. If, the if there's a delay in the insulin production, there's automatically a delay in suppression of glucagon. For 20 minutes after you eat, not only are you picking up glucose from your gut, 
but the liver is continuing to contribute. So you get a tremendous postprandial hyperglycemia. So the first phase of insulin secretion becomes very important. And I've shown you this slide before, and I've said that this is what happens in people with type 2 diabetes, the red being the type 2 diabetes. You can't produce enough insulin, you keep your glucagon up. Uh, so the question is, we've discussed the incretin effect before. Again, it's markedly attenuated in type 2 diabetes. And I've shown you that when you infuse GLP-1, you can get a very good effect. But this is driven by glucose, not by the uh, presence of the drug. And what is other, the other issue is that the GLP-1s tend to change gut motility. Now, why is that important? Think about this. If you're really, 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 really hungry, do you really want your stomach to act as a reservoir? You don't want it to hold up the food. You want to get it out there so you can get out of the food quickly. So in people with type 2 diabetes, even though their sugar is high in the blood, the intracellular glucose is relatively low. So the stomach believes there's relative hypoglycemia. So the stomach speeds up. Because it speeds up, you basically can continue to eat, and you tend to increase your appetite. If you can slow the stomach down so the stomach feels full, you will decrease your appetite. And GLP-1s tend to do that very effectively. What else do GLP-1s do? And this actually is a study not, only, not necessarily of a direct GLP-1. It's a drug like a DPP-4 that's allowed endogenous GLP-1 to be secreted. And you look at the diabetic mouse uh, on the left, which has clearly lost its in, uh, the architecture of the islets. Look at the non-diabetic mouse on the right. The islet is rich. It's full of green, which is the insulin cells. The red cells are the glucagon cells, like a necklace on the outside. While the diabetic cell, the glucagon cells, have taken over the inside because the beta cells are lost. And when you expose them to the GLP-1, you see the architecture redeveloping in a normal way. So clearly, not only are we helping the functional aspects of insulin secretion, we're helping the structural aspects, at least in animals. And I've sort of gone through this with you before, so I won't let you uh, belabor the point. But when you put it in graphical terms, there was a 50% decrease in apoptosis of these cells in culture just by the presence of GLP-1. We know that GLP-1 is secreted in the, uh, in the uh, gut, but basically it is cleaved right away. It is cleaved in the first two amino acids, and that's by, done by the en enzyme DPP-4. And basically, because it is cleaved, it becomes inactive. This is very rapidly done. And so therefore, if you can block this enzyme, you can allow for endogenous hyper uh, increases in, uh, in uh, endogenous GLP-1 secretion. So we've got two agents, the DPP-4 inhibitors, which are pills. They preserve endogenous GLP, give you about a threefold. Remember that experiment, threefold increase in GLP-1 levels. And you've got GLP-1 agents, you've got the analogs, oh, sorry, the mimetics, which is exenatide, and the exenatide once weekly, uh, or the analogs, which is liraglutide, they raise GLP-1s about 10 to 12 fold. And when you combine DPP-4s with metformin, you get a further enhancement of GLP-1s. Whether this is clinically relevant still remains an open question, but the combination certainly works very well. When you look at the DPP on, and its effect on basal cell preservation and regeneration. Vildagliptin has not been okayed in the, uh, by, by the FDA in the United States. It is available in the rest of the world and basically shows you a significant decrease in apoptosis and an increase in islet cell mass. They do not cause weight gain, do not cause weight loss, which what the GLP-1s do, but the DPP-4s don't, but they do not cause weight gain. This is a fascinating study, and I felt this was very crucially important. This is a particular study which took individuals who came in with a myocardial infarction. Remember that 70% of people with a myocardial infarction will have stress hyperglycemia. So these people had stress hyperglycemia. They were randomized to either citagliptin or placebo. And at the end of 12 weeks, notice the number of people on citagliptin that continued to have diabetes was significantly lower than the number who continued to have diabetes in the placebo group. Two versus nine. That's the red bar on the, second, on the second bar. If you then looked at the number who reverted to normal, 26 versus 15. But you know, you're saying, well, these people are treated. What do you expect? You're treating them. Don't fool me. They did an oral glucose tolerance test. Notice that the people on the, on the citagliptin, the oral glucose tolerance test improved back to normal. Well, that's interesting, but they're still treated. 
you did an IV glucose tolerance test, the people on the citagliptin had re-establishment of the first phase of insulin secretion. You are not only treating the diabetes, you are actually rejuvenating the beta cell in 12 weeks. So clearly, these agents have a phenomenal role in the process of preservation. GLP-1 agonists, we've talked about exenatide, we've talked about, sorry, exenatide long-acting, and basically they have the same effect. They improve beta cell responses in type 2 diabetes. And you see here a, a low dose or a high dose of exenatide giving you a very good response in terms of plasma glucose and an amazing response in terms of a corresponding insulin. And again, notice, once the glucose gets down to normal, the presence of the drug no longer matters. You will not secrete insulin. So the risk for hypoglycemia. The other issue here was that in you got hemoglobin A1C down, and it, was uh, 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 it, it remained cl clamped, but you continued to have weight loss. You were able to regulate appetite. Why can you regulate appetite? Well, one is because of the effect on gastric emptying. So you fill the stomach, you're more likely to get full. Number two is the stomach produces ghrelin. Ghrelin is a drug, uh, is a hormone that turns on appetite. If you can stop producing ghrelin, and as you fill the stomach, you do, you stop producing ghrelin in terms of appetite. And GLP-1 by itself has an anti-appetite uh, effect. So that in effect, we've got pretty good evidence to suggest why the GLP-1s may have beneficial effects on weight. Not to be used for weight loss, but in people with diabetes, it does induce weight. So let's go back to the case. At 27 months post-diagnosis, her weight is down to 187 pounds, Fasting sugar is 104, hemoglobin is A1C is 6.2%. I get a phenomenal report from my insurance company. I did very well. But you know what? The brown stuff happens. And so at, uh, uh, a bit later, she's down, down to 182 pounds. So she's losing weight. Her fasting sugar is 163. Her hemoglobin A1C is back up to 7.9%. What do you do now? Should you add another sensitizer, like a TZDP or glitazone? Or should you use sulfonylureas? Or should we have a requiem mass under sulfonylureas? Well, the ADOPT study was a very interesting study. It took individuals who were naive to drugs. They had diabetes, they were drug naive. They were randomized to either rosiglitazone, I know it's a bad name, but uh, glitazone, metformin, and a sulfonylurea. The question was, how long before you needed a second agent? Sulfonylureas failed in 33 months. Metformin failed in 45 months. The glitazone took 57 months to fail. What happened? Why did the rosiglitazone continue to allow you to maintain uni monotherapy? Well, at the end of the study, they looked by HOMA, uh, HOMA mechanisms. They looked at what the drugs did. And when they looked for insulin resistance, no question. The TZD improved insulin resistance 77%. Metformin improved resistance 54%. Sulfonylurea is about 23%. When they looked to see what is happening to the beta cell after five years, the sulfonylurea never stopped the beta cells from dying. It didn't increase the speed of beta cell death. Notice it's 6%, which is what normal is in people with diabetes. It didn't increase it, but it didn't stop it. Metformin stopped it down, dropped it down to 3%, and TZDs dropped it down to 2%. We were getting closer and closer to that magical 1 to 1.5%. We were preserving, so TCDs potentially can have an uh, effect. And when you use a combination of TCD and metformin, it has been shown over and over again to give you a good response in terms of hemoglobin A1C. There's a box warning for CHF, but please remember, there is no direct effect of the TCD on the heart. The TCDs cause you to retain fluid by action at the distal convoluted tubule. If you have a predisposed myocardium, you'd get extra fluid, a percentage will go into congestive heart failure. I think it's very important to understand that this is not a direct effect of the, uh, of the uh, medication on the, uh, on the beta cell, uh, on, the, uh, on the heart. So what about sulfonylureas? The oldest therapies for type 2 diabetes gives you a 1.5 to 2% decrease in hemoglobin A1C. It takes advantage of the pathophysiology. You've got beta cell dysfunction. This makes the beta cell work better. But it doesn't stop it from dying. How, this is how, uh, how the insulin is produced in the beta cell. You pick up glucose, 
uh, it changes in the Emden-Meyer pathway to develop ATP. ATP closes the potassium channel, causes a membrane potential, opens the calcium channel. Calcium goes into the uh, beta cell, and because it goes in, it recruits the vacuoles of insulin, lines them up against the beta cell wall, and releases them. And that's how you secrete insulin. And the beta cell is working normally. It's got some stored insulin, so it releases it first. That's your first phase, and then it recruits to get the second phase. Why did the sulfonylureas fall into disrepute? Well, it fell into disrepute because there was a study done called the UGDP. In this study, it was shown that the uh, sulfonylureas were associated with a higher incidence of myocardial infarctions. Also, there was a, a study done, a retrospective telephone survey study done at the Mayo Clinic, where they asked people when they had, after they had their heart attacks what medications they were taking. It turned out that people who were with diabetes who were on gliburide, not all sulfonylureas, gliburide, had larger myocardial infarcts and had poor survival rates. But one must remember that the UK PDS was done in direct relationship to UGDP. What UK PDS set out to prove, pre-hoc, was that this could not happen because of the drugs. And in fact, when you look at UK PDS, the immediate results that came out in 1997, there was no question. There was no increased incidence of myocardial infarction. In fact, there was a non-statistically significant 15% decrease. When you looked at the extension of UK PDS over the 10 following years, there was a statistically significant decrease in myocardial infarction. So there's no question sulfonylureas aren't necessarily bad. I think that gliburide is clearly associated with risk, and there is good physiological reason why it might be able to explain that. The physiological reason is there are potassium channels both in the heart and in the beta cell. The potassium channel in the beta cell and the heart are coded by two different genes, but these sulfonylureas have similar effects. They can close the, beta cell, the potassium channel in the heart. If you close the potassium channel in the heart, you increase the oxygen demand of the heart. And therefore, in an ischemic myocardium, that might cause a problem. It turns out that gliburide has much more affinity for the potassium channel in the heart than glipizide or uh, glimepiride. And really, a drug that's not available in the United States, dimicron, uh, has even less effects on the potassium channel in the heart. So in effect, sulfonylureas are different on their effects in the heart. So I've sort of gone through this very quickly in the interest of time. Most importantly, in hypoxia, you want a potassium channel that's open so you can cut down the oxygen demand of the heart. If you close it, then you're going to increase contractility, but it's also going to workload, and that's what you don't want. And that's the reason why potassium channels may be troublesome. That's the reason why sulfonylureas, especially gliburide, may be troublesome in this impact. The others are not as troublesome. Now, once you've gone to this point, what's your next step? Well, your next step is, if you can't get control, you've got to consider insulin. This point, I think I'm going to stop here, and we'll sort of go to the next step. Thank you very much for uh, your attention.